Bob Olson, please come up here. I was invited because I was involved in making U-233 back at Savannah River in about 1964. I was a young squirt then. I've grown up considerably since then. <laughs> uh, my background. When I was a senior in high school in 1956, I took part in a science fair and our noontime speaker was at that time the head of the nuclear engineering department at NC State, and he convinced me that I wanted to be a nuclear engineer. So I graduated from high school, went to NC State, and four years later, by golly, I was a nuclear engineer. Uh, had a lot of adventures along the way, but uh, I stayed and got a master's degree in physics. And then I went to work at the Savannah River plant in a group called the Reactor Technology Division. They also had Savannah River Laboratory, but the plant felt they should have their own technical people, and so I worked there. Uh, we were told by the AEC to make U-233 by irradiating thorium. We had five reactors, and I don't know what's declassified yet about them, and I didn't put it on a slide, but if you'd like to learn about them, there are two unclassified resources, uh, AEC documents, DP-999 and DP-1000. DP was for DuPont. One of those describes making higher isotopes of plutonium all the way up beyond plutonium and the curium and californium. And the other describes a demonstration where we only loaded the very center part of a reactor so we could put all the coolant flow through just a few fuel assemblies and get a high flux. We started that little campaign after work started in Oak Ridge on the high flux reactor. And before the high flux reactor could start up, we had achieved a higher neutron, steady state neutron flux than it has ever been able to achieve. So we did some fun things. Oh, and then I got lured to come to UT to uh, teach the lab part of the senior nuclear engineering lab and get a PhD. So I did that. Producing U-233 seems simple. You irradiate thorium-232, it captures a neutron, becomes protactinium-233, which then decays to U-233 plus a beta. And that, that seems pretty simple. But there's a problem. The uh, protactinium-233 has a half-life of 27 days. If a fast neutron collides with protactinium-233, it becomes protactinium-232 plus a neutron. And this has a disadvantage in that it decays to U-232, which is a rather benign isotope. Uh, it doesn't do anything much except decay. And you can read down the list of the decay products. Uh, U-232 has a nice long half-life of 68.9 years, but then all the decay products have sh rather short half-lives. And when it gets to thallium-208, it decays by emitting a 2.6 MeV gamma. And this means that if you make 233 and it's contaminated with uranium-232, you can't just work with it in a glove box the way you can with U-235 and PU-239. You have to be in a hot cell or work robotically. But in a liquid-fueled reactor, 
you just handle U-233 first, extract it as a liquid into a shielded cask uh, where it will cool and solidify. And uh, then you take it to where you want to use it and heat it and it comes out as a liquid and it, it works very well. And a liquid fuel reactor use online chemical processing to remove the protactinium-233 so it doesn't stay there and have this fast neutron interaction that gives you 232. Another possible solution is to isolate the thorium in a blanket around the reactor with graphite to prevent fast neutrons from ever getting to the protactinium. When we started out to make U-233 at Savannah River, we did not know this problem with U-232. So we put about nearly half of the positions in the reactor, we put thorium target material. That enabled us to put all the coolant flow through the uranium driver fuel, which enabled us to increase the flux quite a bit. And we left the thorium in for a long time. And then we discharged it, sent it to chemical separations, and they found that it was horribly radioactive. <laughs> and so we changed our plans and we only irradiated the thorium for a week or so, and then discharged those target assemblies and replaced them with more thorium. And that made a nice product that it was possible to work with. It occurred to me later in life, they had irradiated thorium at Hanford and in the shipping port reactor. Why didn't someone tell us about this problem? And the only answer I found is that was at the height of the Cold War and absolutely everything was secret. <laughs> Even what you needed to know was secret. For instance, we didn't want the Soviets to know that we were irradiating thorium. We wanted them to think that reactor was making plutonium or tritium for weapons. <laughs> and I don't know what's been declassified about all this. Everything. Say it all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid there may be a security guy in the audience. Don't worry about it. No one no, will no, there about it but us in this room. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're trying to get me in trouble. Well, in, in the case, the, the, this contamination with U-232 is both good news and bad news. If you're worried about proliferation of weapons material, uh, in most cases, the uranium that you U-233 that you produce will be too darn hot for anyone to steal or work with to make a weapon. We did make a nuclear explosion using U-233 and PU-239, and Wikipedia says it was a failure because it was expected to have a yield in the 30-some kiloton range, but it was only, the yield was only about 20 kilotons. So I think that whole effort was abandoned. So if there are questions. I've been hearing people argue that chemical separation is really, really challenging because of the high levels of radioactivity. Can you describe uh, what it was like working with stuff that was that radioactive and, you know, how did you overcome the challenge of trying to work with it. At Savannah River, we had two big chemical separation facilities uh, called canyons with very thick concrete walls. And uh, the, the, the chemical separation was done by those folks. And they, they routinely handled radiated uh, natural uranium and fully enriched uranium in those facilities that had been irradiated, so the radiation was no problem for them. 
Thomas Dan Peterson from Copenhagen Atomics, one of the companies trying to develop molten salt reactors. My question is, um, we know that there's uh, some uranium-233 still in stock here in the U.S., uh, but doing your research, did you find any other countries who enriched uh, thorium to uranium-233, whether it's Russia or Germany or France or some other country? No, I, 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 I vaguely remember reading about other countries doing it, but it's gone from my mind right now. Sorry. So I, I have one last question for you. How many bajillion becquerels of radiation have you exposed yourself to, and are you feeling okay? <laughs> I have been in radiation areas. I've been in a plastic suit to protect me from tritium in the air. Uh, DuPont reported to employees what their occupational radiation exposure was, and when Westinghouse took over, they quit that. <laughs> <laughs> it was required by law, they just didn't do it. But my occupational radiation exposure, so far as I know, was 2.05 rem. There you go. But I had a uh, Tech 99M injection so a gamma camera could look at my heart. A trustworthy health physicist told me I got about 10 rem from that. There you go. And, and I have an annual CAT scan to look at an aneurysm in a femoral artery. So. Well. Keep it up. You look great. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much.